Gentlemen, thanks for joining me on this uh, opportunity to discuss uh, the relaunch of John Murray's commentary on the Epistle to the Romans. We have the uh, privilege of sitting here at Westminster Theological Seminary uh, in the room that once was the library and would actually have served as the room where Murray uh, would have had all of his works on Romans laid out and studied and wrote this actual commentary uh, on the Epistle to the Romans. So uh, this is a great occasion for us and a great joy for us to be able to talk about one who has been so influential in our lives and our ministries, uh, scholarship, and this book uh, of Romans, which has been so central to the Reform movement, the Christian church, and uh, to the Protestant movement historically. Uh, so we're, it's a great to be with you and to be able to talk about some of the features of the commentary as well as the doctrine that comes to us in the book of Romans. And let me start there. <clears throat> Let's ask the question about union with Christ. So it's clearly a prevailing theme uh, in Paul's theology. Uh, John Murray, uh, following John Calvin, uh, articulates it very clearly, and in fact uses it as an organizing rubric to think about salvation. Mm -hmm. Dave, could you talk to us a little bit about what does that mean, uh, the category of union with Christ mean? Mm -hmm. How is it different from some of the alternative approaches to talking about salvation? And then as we get into it, we'll talk about why does this matter? I think the first thing that I would say is people who have read Murray, most likely their first exposure to Murray would have been his book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. Right. And it is there where he actually talks about that very thing, what Christ has done and how it is applied to us. And that rubric, that organizing principle of union with Christ is really the core of that book, even though union with Christ takes up particular chapter in that volume. But this particular commentary on Romans also speaks very much about union with Christ because Paul has a lot to say about union with Christ in his Romans. And Murray's commentary picks up that most robustly for the first time in Romans 6, where in verses 1 through 4, Paul speaks about us being united to Christ in his death and uses the image of baptism to speak about our union with Christ in, in that regard. And I think what we need, I think, to first recognize is that this understanding of the application of salvation is one that needs to be contrasted from a conception of salvation as a, a neatly wrapped box that God gives us where we get all these things, these gifts of justification and sanctification and adoption, as though these are pretty little gifts that we unwrap at various points in our lives. When, in fact, we don't just get those gifts, we actually get the giver himself. And so in the gospel, we actually receive Christ. And, and Murray will speak about that union with Christ, that solidarity with Christ as a spiritual and mystical union, that what Christ's work has done for us is actually something that we are brought in with him. So as I think uh, Mark has said um, before, that we have him he has us. There is this beautiful connection inseparable by the gift of the Spirit whereby we receive the very person, Jesus Christ the Lord, who is the humiliated and exalted Son of God and all that that represents. So in Christ's exaltation, we receive the one who has actually been seated at the right hand of God the Father, whereby through his obedience to his Father, bearing our sin upon him and being made alive in his resurrection, that we are with him. We receive him, not just stuff that he gives us. And so I think this model of union with Christ is not just some sort of foreign object imposed on the text. It's what the scripture describes as the way we need to understand our salvation by virtue of our being tethered to Christ by the gift of the Spirit. So the emphasis helps us with a focus as we think about our salvation not that we're not focused on the benefits, not that we're not grateful for right. the benefits, but the focus is actually on the person in whom we receive all of those benefits. Right. Yeah. Right. So let me ask all of you, what do you think are the, what's the significance of union with Christ pastorally? What difference does it make? Well, it's interesting. In the 
in the, the days of Murray's work on the Romans commentary, he is, he is doing what he's doing with Union with Christ in a time where that's not necessarily the most popular route for evangelicals. Mm -hmm. Since the 19th century, well into the 20th, there was a, there was a war raging. Um, you had the social gospel on one end, and then you had denials of penal substitutionary atonement and the, the importance of the atonement generally coming from another direction, which, which led a lot of orthodox, conservative, really solid brethren to write book after book after book after book on the cross. Mm. And there developed a kind of crucicentrism, mm -hmm. a cross-centered Christianity. Many books were titled that way. Mm -hmm. Cross-centered Christianity, which also quickly translated into justification-centered gospel. And it's not that the cross is unimportant, and it's certainly not that justification doesn't matter. But what was arguably lost was a loss of a sense of proportion. Mm -hmm. The reason the cross is so important and the reason justification is so important is because of the identity of Christ, who Christ is. The one who died is what makes his death different. Um, the justification that is being united with him and his righteousness, it's about him and his righteousness that makes justification part mm -hmm. of the good news. Um, if I may, I think right outside of Romans, uh, in the Pauline letter collection in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Calvin recognized a kind of a Pauline shorthand for these truths in chapter 1, verse 30, which Murray seems very sensitive to as well. At the, end, at the end of chapter 1 in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, it is God's doing that you are in Christ Jesus, who has been made with respect to us or to us by God wisdom and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. What do we have in those few words at the end of 1 Corinthians 1? We have the priority of divine action when it comes to salvation. It is God's doing. But what is it that God did? He put you in Christ Jesus. Yeah. That is itself the nature of saving grace. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? How is being in Christ Jesus saving? Well, he has been made, with respect to us, wisdom of God. And... Justification or righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Benefits which are distinct from one another. The gospel depends on that distinction between justification and sanctification and adoption and glorification. They're also inseparable, inextricable, if you like, because of their relationship to Christ to whom we are united. They are distinct. They are inseparable. They come by virtue of union with the one Christ, and so they are derivative of who Christ is, who is himself the gift, and they are also, as we've taught here often at Westminster, they are all eschatological as well. Mm -hmm. The Christ who is given to us is one whose resurrection has inaugurated our resurrection to come. Um, so union with Christ is not just a way of saying, here's one great benefit among others. Mm -hmm. It's the Christ given who is the gospel. Mm -hmm. Our union with him means that it's good news for us, that he is who he is, because he is who he is with respect to us. Mm -hmm. I think Murray does a great job of unpacking that for us, and what a pastorally relevant thing to hear, is that you are hidden in Christ, who is all these things with respect to you, and you are those things in him. Because sometimes we need to be reminded who we really are, and our feelings are not always a reliable guide to that. Yeah. The gospel reminds us where we really live, yeah. and that is outside of ourselves in Christ himself. You know, my mind is drawn to Calvin's phrase, you know, the gospel is Christ clothed in his gospel. Oh, it's so a how, expression. Yeah, how do we receive the gospel? Mm. Christ clothed in his gospel. Mm. One of the implications of the types of things that Mark is talking about is there are certain traditions that have <clears throat> emphasized one particular benefit over another. Right. Right to where some would be arguably almost an exclusively, if not exclusively, legal or forensic-based notion of an application of salvation, which does not only a disservice to the application of redemption itself, but to actually the meaning and significance of the work of Christ himself on our behalf. Mm -hmm. And so we don't get to pick and choose the benefits any more than we get to pick the Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ has secured all of these things for us, and we get uh, the whole Christ. The whole it also Christ. means yeah. that we don't really enjoy any one benefit. Correct. If they are not, uh, if that benefit is not attended with all the others all the in others. some facet. Yeah. Right. So here's our protection against antinomianism. Mm -hmm. 
Here's also our protection against forms of legalism. Mm -hmm. There is no justification without sanctification. Mm -hmm. There just isn't one. Because right. there's only, in Calvin's mm -hmm. often used expression, there's only one Christ, and to imagine a benefit mm -hmm. really being yours without another, is he said to tear Christ, tear into, Christ pieces. into pieces. Tear Christ into pieces. Yep. So for our viewers, define antinomianism and focus on that in particular and tell us how union with Christ uh, counters antinomianism. And, yeah, yeah. antinomianism, the word itself suggests being against law. And that's, that is much of the concern here, is that there is a negative relationship to law. More specifically, it's uh, an aversion to seeing the necessity of obedience and uh, law-keeping as the form of the Christian life, an aversion to seeing that as positively related to my salvation, as necessary, in fact, to my the, the full orb reality of my union with Christ. The reason there is aversion to it is because it's quickly confused with my obedience being the ground of my justification, which we absolutely want to reject out of hand. But rejecting that as the ground of our justification is one thing. Rejecting it as part of God's work of salvation is a whole other. And the way that we resist the pull of antinomianism, the lawlessness, which we think of makes God even more gracious than he really is. He's really just love, unconditional acceptance. And the gospel is all about how I'm free from obedience, free from the necessity of obedience. The way we avoid that really dangerous error is by remembering we are united to one Christ. Right. And in that Christ, we have all of his benefits, not some of them. But that Christ is sufficient for us, not just at the beginning and not just at the end, but it's his grace at work in us mm -hmm. by the Spirit that more and more conforms us to his glorious image. Yeah. Uh, it's not as though sanctification is by our bootstraps. That's not what we mean by rejecting antinomianism. But we are trying to account for a more robust picture of the power of God's grace, which deals with our, our standing as well as our condition. Mm -hmm. And the gospel really is that far-reaching. Yeah. Scott, talk uh, to us about how the, uh, what Mark has just laid out for us, the old man and the new man. How does this relate? Yeah, uh, Murray's just great on this. Um, on, on antinomianism, it, that's how Murray begins in Romans 6. Paul says, mm -hmm. what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? That's the question. That's right. what sets up right. the, the, mm -hmm. the discussion on sanctification. And of course, by no means. Um, how can we who died to sin still live in it? It's a rhetorical question. How can you think that Christ died, therefore you died to sin, Christ raised, therefore is raised, therefore you live? How can you think that there's a possibility of you living in sin? And so that's what he's going to be developing here. And uh, one other thing Murray says, uh, um, let me... Uh, based on verse 4, 6 4, Romans 6 4, Paul says, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So I just wanted uh, listeners to get a sense of what Murray says about this. He, he works on this phrase, the glory of the Father. Mm. What could it mean? Here's what he says mm -hmm. It's more in accord with usage to think of the glory as that through which Christ was raised. The glory of God is the majesty of God, the sum of His perfections. If this meaning holds in this instance, then the Father's majesty or perfection in its fullness is conceived of as operative in the resurrection of Christ. And in that event, this expression, more than any other in the New Testament, would signalize the redemptive, vindicatory, and revelatory significance of the Father's act in raising Christ from the dead. The plenitude of the Father's glory is manifest in the resurrection of His own Son. Mm -hmm. If you can read that without being moved yeah. with respect to the gospel, then you haven't understood Paul and you haven't understood Murray. You can see Murray here yeah. as the pastor and the devotional theologian saying, how can you understand the resurrection mm -hmm. any other way but that the plenitude of the Father's glory being manifest yeah. in that resurrection. Yeah. So, um, to, to your question, <clears throat> Murray goes on to talk about um, the old man and new man. So, verse 6, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. One of the things Murray's trying to disabuse us of 
is this idea that we have this old man inside of us fighting with the new man. And so the, the, the Christian life is this sort of sanctification, old man, new man conflict taking place. Uh, Murray says, it can't be that way. He says, this is quoting him, it's a mistake to think of the believer as both an old man and a new man, or as having in him both the old man and the new man. The latter, new man, in view of regeneration, the former, old man, because of remaining corruption. That this is not Paul's concept is made apparent here by the fact that the old man is represented as having been crucified with Christ. And the tense of the verb indicates a once-for-all definitive act after the pattern of Christ's crucifixion. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? It's important because Murray goes on to, to show, and by the way, he even references principles of conduct. So listeners ought to know it's chapter 9, I think, where he's dealing with this in principles of conduct. He developed, developed it a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a fantastic, I think, almost a life-changing um, chapter in Murray's book. Mm -hmm. But he goes on to, to, to discuss why this is so important because if we think of an old man, new man, then we miss the force of the reality of our union with Christ, that we have been changed. We haven't been partly yeah. changed. Our nature has been regenerated. There's corruption that remains, and Murray will talk about that in his discussion of Romans 7 as he mm -hmm. talks about this conflict back and forth, which, which to me is, again, a fantastic yeah. uh, discussion in Murray's commentary. But here he wants us to recognize that, no, the old man is dead. Just as Christ died, the old man died. And so now we are raised in newness of life yeah. with remaining corruption. But as we've said before, mm -hmm. uh, Paul's point, Murray's point, sin remains, but sin does not reign. Yeah. It no longer reigns. The dominion, the power ha has been put to death at the cross yeah. and given to us in regeneration. So we're not old man, new man. We are new creation. Yeah. And by virtue of that then, sanctification in its process, both definitive now, but in its process, will continue in us by virtue of the Spirit's work. You know, the, great, the good news of that, it was illustrated for me in a pastoral situation as I'm discipling an individual who was struggling with an ongoing sin. That it's just, it was kind of a lifelong thing that they just weren't able to shake off. And as we walk through Romans 6, what you've just gone through, and the way Murray exposits that for us, uh, the light went on for them. And somehow in their hearing of the gospel, either they hadn't been taught it or it hadn't come through to them, that this, that, that not only does God justify you, but He changes you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And He makes you new, makes you a new person. And as the person was wrestling with this struggle, this, this sin, they literally looked up from the page in Romans 6 and they said, you mean I don't have to live like this anymore? You mean I can be different? Mm -hmm. And they actually would date that to the point where they actually came to faith. It was the hope of change that actually brought them to faith. So maybe if you could talk for just a minute, what do you think the pastoral implications of this are? How does this, how does this understanding of union with Christ and being in Christ and the change that that makes and the benefits we get, what does that mean pastorally for people? You know, alongside the struggle with sin, I think the other very frequent pastoral reality is looking for ways to bring encouragement and comfort in context of suffering. Mm. And it's union with Christ that functions in Paul's argument in Romans 8, 17 particularly, uh, to explain how suffering is not just the way it is. For Christians, suffering is the form that their, our union with Christ takes, and we are to look to Christ who moved from suffering to glory, to know for certain that our suffering will end in glory as well. Mm -hmm. If then you suffer with him, then you will be glorified with him. Mm -hmm. The with him in Paul's argument there is his way of deploying the pastoral value of union with Christ. Mm -hmm. the, the significance of what Christ has done is not just out there it helps you interpret yourself. Mm -hmm. It helps you read your experiences rightly and not fall prey to the distortions that uh, of temptation, of interpreting it in many other ways. God is not with me. He is not faithful. This is extraordinary. Uh, no, the sufferings of Christ as they led to final glory, it's not just the Christ you are united to as some kind of abstraction. Mm -hmm. It's the Christ of history. Mm -hmm. And His history is your real history. Mm -hmm. So as you suffer as a Christian, do so in the confidence 
that your glory, your eternal life, your resurrection, your relief in those wonderful forms is no less certain than it is that Christ cannot be unraised from the dead. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think just in the similar vein, that idea that the suffering that I'm enduring, the pain, whatever kind it is, whatever duration that it is, is just something I have to grin and bear it. And in many ways, I think we think of the gospel as something that is our possession yet future. Mm. But when we receive the whole Christ, and as Mark has described from Romans 8, 17, that we are joint heirs with Christ in his suffering as well as joint heirs with him in his glory. Those are, th- those, that package belongs together. So if I could put it this way pastorally, when someone is enduring a hardship, we can confidently say, this is God's purpose for you now, mm. and Christ is with you now, and this is not without meaning and significance. Mm. So you don't have to grin and bear it. You trust in the Christ who has suffered for you and has been glorified, and this is his goodness, even if it's a difficult providence that you're enduring. This is part of his love for you and a manifestation that you are a child of God. Yeah. And one good. more way that the union with Christ mm-hmm. idea functions, I think, in Paul's letter is doesn't get much attention, but in terms of congregational and communal life. Yeah. Uh, when in Romans 14, Paul is dealing with scrupulosity and the weak and the strong, mm-hmm. it's union with Christ mm-hmm. that needs to be the driver yes. of how we bear with one another mm-hmm. and why. Mm-hmm. Uh, because in every one of the relationships among, within and among Christ's body, Christ is the determiner and he is the one you account for mm-hmm. in negotiating the difficulties and complexities of the weak and the strong and mm-hmm. avoiding scrupulosity. It's not just the matter of give me my list of rules and let's go. Mm-hmm. It's how do you love your brother? Mm-hmm. And your loving your brother is going to shape mm-hmm. your relationship to any list of that sort. Mm-hmm. And it's because you are united to Christ with them and therefore bonded together. When I was, uh, for a brief time in pastoral ministry, after I left, uh, this, uh, was finished at seminary, I was in Texas, and um, I remember having a particular moment one day when it struck me how many people had uh, come to me to talk about, in various ways, the problem with assurance. They weren't sure. Mm-hmm. I remember one man, and some of the, most of these people were outside the church I pastored because they were people that I'd known previously and um, I remember one man coming saying, look, I, um, you know, I walked down the aisle 20 years ago and I remember it well, but is that it? Is that, is that my assurance? And um, to your question, uh, what, what does Paul say at the end of Romans 8? Uh, Nothing's able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You don't, you don't get assurance by looking at that act that I did or I was better this day than that day, or my sin's not all that bad. That's navel-gazing, and, and Paul won't allow for it. Scripture won't allow for it. You're not navel-gazing, you're Savior-gazing. And you always lift up your eyes and mm-hmm. look at Christ, and you say to yourself, I'm united to Him, mm-hmm. the very same one that walked. Yeah. I'm united to Him by virtue of the Spirit's work in me. That will produce in you assurance if you understand it in the way that Scripture mm-hmm. speaks That's about it. Stuff. It's not just a benefit. It's... Yeah. We're united to the person. This is a real relationship. I think that's the difference I've noticed is in, in the years as, as my own preaching and teaching uh, growing into the understanding of union with Christ as it's reflected or revealed in the Scripture and then reflected in how we do our theology here uh, was the emphasis on the personal. Uh, so often pastors are pointing people to a thing or a mm-hmm. concept, mm-hmm. an idea, or people are looking at an event or trying to understand a category theologically, mm-hmm. all of which are, can be vital and important. But I think the emphasis on union with Christ focuses people's faith on the person yeah. that they are in relationship to and that is in relationship to them, and it's mm-hmm. just so critical. And we get the whole Christ. We get the whole Christ. You know, we tell our, our brethren who are hesitant about coming to the table, the, the weakest faith gets the same full, powerful Christ yeah. as the strongest faith yeah. does. Yeah, lovely. That's yeah. a rule for the Christian life and yeah. not just for the table, but what a wonderful uh, point of contact, as it were, for the Christian life the yeah. table can be that yeah. way.